Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies, and we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty and fashion trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Betsy Scaresbrick, and I'm so happy to have you guys all back here with me. So if you've noticed, my schedule has switched around because I got a new job, and that is being a server and a bartender at Chili's, which is it's been fun. It's been a learning experience for sure. I've been training the past few days. I've actually never been a server before. So this is a, I had a ton of few, a ton of few, a ton of like odd jobs and stuff that I would do during the summer and doing the school year, during the school year from high school and all the way through college. Uh, but I've never actually been a server or a bartender in a restaurant before. So it's been a fun learning experience for me. Um, yeah, that's basically what I've been up to. I am working all the time. I just got my room repainted, which is really nice. I went from like a, a, pastel yellow to a deep khaki green so it makes the room feel a little bit a little bit cozier and I it feels a little bit older um like a more more adult not that the room is older um but yeah so not a lot has been going on with me just been just been working at Chili's that's about it just just working and hanging out um still we're still in a pandemic so I am not going out anywhere, really, very, seeing very many people, unless I'm socially distanced from them, as as per the, the rules. Uh, but anyways, enough about me. Let's get into the show. So today I'm going to be talking to y'all about, uh, hear me out, I'm going to be talking to you about foot health because we are in summer and, you know, feet are stinky and they're sweaty. So I'm going to give you guys some tips to maybe remedy that if you want to try them. I'm also going to be, it, as I mentioned, it is summertime. I'm going to be talking to you about your skincare for summer. And that's going to be focusing on sunscreens and also going to be talking, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, tanning and how to do so safely in the summertime. I'm also going to talk to y'all about maskne and that is mask acne, which I know a lot of people are facing right now from having to wear masks all the time. So, you know, they're, they're facing a lot of, a lot of acne in the areas, in the area of their face that's covered by a mask. So I'm going to talk to you guys about, you know, where that comes from, ways you can fight it, and also how to enhance your new masked look with different makeup trends. And finally, this might only be fun for me, but because I've moved home, I have been doing a lot of cleaning and purging of stuff from my childhood bedroom, my bathroom, all that kind of stuff. And I came across a bunch of old, old makeup that I basically have just been hoarding. I I think when I was in middle school and high school and mostly middle school, I think, and early high school, I was hoarding a lot of makeup because I didn't really think about the the negative effects that old makeup can have on your face. And, and you know, I collected it from f- friends who were getting rid of makeup. I collected it from my mom who was getting rid of makeup. And so I have a ton of... <laughs> 
<laughs> just old makeup. So I thought it would be funny if I were to like look through it and and talk to you guys about the journey that I've made coming from when I first started wearing makeup to products that I use now. So with that, let's get into the episode. Okay, so yes, yes, today we are going to be talking about foot health. That is the health of your feet. You heard me right. (laughs) Now, I'll be the first one to admit I am one of those annoying people who's like, ew, feet, which I know is basic, boring, I said it already, annoying, but I also know I'm not the only one who feels that way. I've always said (laughs) that I have ugly feet, so maybe me saying I hate feet is a generalized response to me hating my own feet, but I, I digress. Maybe, you know, maybe taking better care of my feet will make me feel less, less hatred towards feet in general. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to give you some tips on how to amp up your foot health, ranging from managing your smelly feet to treatments you can do that basically give you a pedicure at home. So starting off with your smelly feet, it is summertime, and I feel like this is something that a lot of people can relate to. Smelly feet, It's a, it, I, I said it already, it's the summertime, means your feet are sweating more, means for me personally, my feet will smell more. I know my family has dealt with this a gajillion ways. We've tried odor eaters. We've tried baking soda in your shoes overnight. We've tried the little balls that supposedly absorb order, odor when you stick them in your shoes. Now, some have worked, some have not. So just bear in mind that different things will probably work for different people. And as I say every episode, I am not a professional. These are just things that I have either learned from researching them or learned from things that, from doing it myself. So after doing a little bit of extra research, I saw a blog post from a doctor of podiatric medicine. That's a foot doctor. And I learned that your feet tend to sweat more than any other part of your body, especially if you're a teenager or if you're pregnant because of hormonal reasons, like hormonal imbalances, etc. So when you combine this with having your feet sweat in a confined space, i.e. your shoes, you are fixing to have some pretty stinky feet. Now, obviously, this varies from person to person and how much you're on your feet or how much you continually wear the same shoes without letting them breathe. But also, if you think your foot smell is getting to an extreme, you should definitely see a doctor maybe and and check on if you have some kind of fungal infection or athlete's foot that would probably need more medical attention than some of these tips that I'm about to tell you. So one of these tips from Dr. Hollander, and he's the doctor of podiatric medicine that I was talking about. Um, so one of these tips is to not wear the same shoes every day, which I know I'm guilty of, and I know it's unavoidable for a lot of people. But what he the the reason behind this is because shoes tend to take up to 24 hours to completely dry out. So wearing them every day would not allow them to dry properly, thus keeping the shoes moist and your feet smelly. He also says to wear socks. And I feel like that's kind of obvious, particularly, the, especially because like, um, well, I say that's obvious, but I, I don't know. For me personally, it just feels weird to wear shoes that without socks, like sneakers without socks feels really weird and kind of foreign to me. Maybe that's why I feel weird about it. But like, I don't know. Uh, He says, wear wear socks, Um, particularly to wear the sweat wicking kind, which gets rid of that extra sweat off your skin and will further that dark and damp environment for your feet. Other tips include, and some of these are kind of wives' tales, like home remedies. Um, they include using baking soda, just sprinkling some in your shoe from toe to heel, letting it absorb overnight, and then shaking it out in the morning. We, my family, has tried this before, 
And, you know, I, I will say that it's worked. It's not, um, I don't think it's like the most effective thing in the entire world, but it is, it, it works enough that I think, um, it's worth giving it a shot if you are one of the people who, uh, who deal, has to deal with smelly feet a lot. Um, it's also suggested, or, well, you, so using, with using the baking soda, um, some websites have also suggested sprinkling baking soda on your feet directly as well, or like, like baby powder on your feet. But also you could just spring for deodorant if you so choose. Um, it's suggested to use aerosol antiper, antiperspirant if you wanted, or there are, some over-the-counter options that are specifically foot deodorants, um, that and also some prescription option, options if you feel that you need a little bit of extra extra attention and extra care for your smelly feet. I've also seen some people suggest using black tea, both drinking it and also soaking your feet in it. I personally have never tried this this trick, so if you have, please let me know how it goes. Um, something that has worked, I will say it's not a long-term solution, but something that's worked for me is using those, I think they're Dr. Scholl's odor eaters, where you cut out the, the shape of your shoe, and basically they're just inserts that you stick inside. Most of the time, they'll be sneakers or loafers of some kind. Um, but it, it generally, everyone concludes that... And this is kind of like basic knowledge. You should wash your feet properly. Make sure they're as dry as possible. Maybe when you wear sneakers, you put on that foot powder or deodorant and to cycle through your shoes. Actually, on the topic of foot washing, I remember, I think it was probably an as seen on TV product type deal where that my mom got. But basically what it was is a, a scrubber. You know how golf shoes do that thing where you golf shoes do that thing there there are things for golf shoes where you or tennis shoes i think actually where you scrub your shoe through them so they don't have um what whatever dirt or residue is left on them so basically it was one of those foot scrubbers it was just a bristly foot scrubber that you stick in your shower it's like a suction cup thing on your shower and you just scrub you scrub your foot on it. Basically, you're just like swiping your foot back and forth. And I don't think, (laughs) I think it was fun to use a couple of times. I have a very ticklish feet, so it was not, (laughs) it was not my personal favorite thing, but it was a fun novelty item (laughs) that I think pushed me and my brother to wash our feet more. Um, so maybe look, look for one of those if you need, if you need some inspiration to wash your feet. Um, but yeah, I think basically just generally keeping track of, of the environment that your feet are in, you know, making sure you're wearing clean socks, you are cycling through your shoes and should you need it using some kind of. I, I'll call it antiperspirant. So that means deodorant, the powder, the aerosol deodorant, whatever, you name it, using that on your foot if you need it. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about in our, our journey of feet health are the ped eggs or like the, like the little foot filers. Um, so maybe your feet are also smelly because of an excess of dead skin mixing with that moisture in your shoes. So you could go for the pet egg. And that's that thing that's basically like a cheese grater for your for the dead skin in on your foot. Or also like an electric th- thing that's basically like a, 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 a whatchamacallit, a, a, a rolling paintbrush type deal, but it's electric. So you just turn it on and it automatically just and it rolls and it, it, it peels your feet basically. Um, I hate, hate, hate scrubbing my feet with a pet egg or with a foot filer or with that electric foot filer because my feet are so ticklish, like in nail salons, I can't, 
I've already talked to you guys about my thing with nail salons where if my nails are too short, I feel so self-conscious that I don't want to go because I, I think they, I feel like they make fun of it, of me because of my short nails. But my toenails are even worse because I've, I've, as I've mentioned before, I hate my feet and I think my toenails are weird. So I don't like getting pedicures at all. If I'm, I'm going to do my toenails, I do them myself. Um, but so I don't like going to get a pedicure because one, I am embarrassed and because two, my feet are so ticklish. So getting my, my foot scrubbed with a foot filer or with a, a ped egg type thing, it, it is a no go for me. I hate it in nail salons. I hate it when I do it myself. My mom loves the, the electric foot filer. She says it, that it doesn't super duper get rid of, it, it doesn't really get rid of calluses or remove them. It smooths them, but it doesn't get rid of them. Um, and you have to change, she says you have to change the roller every so often because it, like any razor, it'll, it'll dull out a little bit, but they come in a pack of four and she highly recommends them, but I personally can't stand them. So if you want to try and get that dead skin off your feet, by all means, go for it. Another way to get off, to get dead skin off of your feet, and you've probably, maybe you've heard of this product or you've tried of it, you've tried it, and that's called baby foot. You guys, this stuff is wild. So it is a product that comes, so the box comes with two plastic bag booties. Like they're literally, they are plastic socks, and they're already lined with this magical gel, which is a combination of, quote, 17 types of natural extracts, and which is according to the website. And also, if to note, if the original booties are too small for you, there's also a men's version that goes up to a size 14. Um, that's really the only difference is that it's a size. And the ingredients list mainly fruit acids, but also the stuff you'd typically find in a chemical peel, which is like glycolic acid, lactic, and salicylic acids, as well as alcohol. Um, and those are some ingredients that we tried or that I talked to y'all about last time talking about anti-aging products. Now, I've used baby foot. My mom calls it baby feet because you know, two feet, but it's the project itself is called baby foot. And I've tried this several times with my mom. So I want to give you some pro tips. So I'm going to be walking you through the process as well as kind of chiming in and telling you maybe some, some tips and tricks that you will want to follow. So number one is to make sure you wash your feet and soak them before starting. And that means, um, that means soaking your feet, soaking your feet in the water, making sure they're nice and clean and nice and dry before you put these booties on. A lot of the times my mom and I will just fill the bathtub up just a couple of inches and let our, let our feet soak. Um, we'll put a little bit of the, that green Vita bath in, you know, our favorite. Um, and soak, I soak 15 minutes. Sometimes you can soak a little bit more. Just make sure that they're clean and your skin is soft. So after you soak your feet, you dry your feet off, pop them in the little plastic booties. And you use the – it comes with um, piece, small pieces of tape to close the loose ends of the booties. And if you have to walk around, you can just toss some big socks over the booties to prevent you from slipping. But if possible – you should just stay put. The box says to leave it on for an hour, and that may be enough for you, but for many, baby foot is most effective when you give it an extra 20 to 30, a, a, an extra amount of time on your feet. I once had it on for like an hour and a half. So, when you're wearing the booties, make sure you really rub your feet in while you're wearing while you're wearing them. I already said that. Um, you know, make sure you're rubbing it in between your toes, rub it on your heels. Make sure your whole foot is completely rubbed in. And sometimes every ten minutes or so, go back in there. Make sure you're rubbing it in between your toes, rubbing it on your heels, making sure the whole surface area of your foot is covered. And 
I, I certainly hope this goes without saying, but please don't put an acid peel on your feet if you have open cuts or sores. I had a few little abrasions on my feet, uh, but nothing that that was like too serious for me to not put it on. Like if just a cut on my foot. Um, so one rule of thumb, and this comes from a Refinery29 article, one rule of thumb is if you have any cuts or abrasions on your feet that would prevent you from getting a pedicure, don't use this foot peel. And that is what you should use as a rule of thumb. Um, and about like warts or other calluses on your feet, this is not going to cure them. It's, it has basically no effect on warts. Um, cracked calluses on your feet are fine, but if you're bleeding and it's an open wound, I would not use this product. So, after you finish the treatment, after you take the booties off, you rinse, you dry your feet, go about your day as normal. After the after you finish this whole process, things are going to be normal for a couple days, sometimes up to even a week. Uh, when you can, soak your feet for the following days. Maybe take a bath instead of a shower. Uh, and it helps. This helps to loosen your skin a little more and make the peeling process start sooner. When the peeling process starts, you guys, it is crazy town. This is one of those things that's so weirdly satisfying, like popping pimples. It is so fun for me. <laughs> um, one word of warning is to be careful not to peel your feet too early. I have been known to, <laughs> been known to my mom, but I am definitely guilty of peeling it too early and that can you could that can make you peel it a little too deep and cause a couple cuts on your feet and it's painful um it feels like a, a popped blister if you peel it too early and you get a little bit deeper than you meant to but it is the results are so satisfying your dead skin will come off in sheets and i wish i understood the science behind this but i don't i don't understand the science and i purposefully did not look at why this happens because I enjoy the magic of the dead skin peeling off of my feet. Um, so I highly recommend that to you if you have time. The process takes a few hours. So when you're wearing the boots, I would wear the little booty, the plastic booties with the the fruit acid in them. Uh, it's a perfect time to maybe get some work done, maybe watch a movie, you know, whatever would allow you to sit there for a long period of time without having to get up. Um, but I highly recommend baby foot because that product is fun if you do it the right way and do it in a safe way. So I hope this answered some questions for y'all that you might have about how to take care of your feet because I know feet are definitely, my feet are the, probably the most neglected part of my body because I, I avoid them. So I hope that maybe gave you some tips for how to work with your smelly feet, how to get dead, rid of dead skin, and maybe how to how to treat yourself to a little spa day. So when we come back, I'm going to be talking about how to take care of your skin specifically for summertime. We'll be talking different types of sunscreen, different type of tanning. So stick around and we'll be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or any where you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. And we are back. 
Uh, so if you are just now tuning in, you missed earlier when I was talking about foot health and ways to care for and beautify your feet. And now we're going to hop into ways to take care of your skin in the summer. Now, I'm going to be talking about both sunscreen as well as safer tanning trips. Tips. So... Hopping into sunscreen. So there are two different types of UV rays, and that's UAV, UVA and UVB rays. A broad spectrum sunscreen protects you from both of these rays. UVA rays can prematurely age your skin, which will cause wrinkling and age spots, which if you want tips on those, I talked a lot about them in my last, we, in my last show. Now UVB rays can burn your skin. So too much exposure to either UVA or UVB rays can cause skin cancer. And the best sunscreen that you can use offers protection from UV light. Which So this brings us to the question, which SPF do we need to use? SPF stands for sun protection factor. Experts recommend using a sunscreen with an SPF of at least 30. Sunscreens with SPFs greater than 50 provide only a small increase in UV protection. High number SPFs last the same amount of time as low number SPFs. Sunscreen is often not applied thoroughly or thickly enough, and it can be washed off during swimming in the pool, in the ocean, or through just sweating. And as a result, sunscreen might be less effective than the SPF number suggests. So I know that I personally am very guilty of applying sunscreen right when I get to, you know, the pool or the beach and then waiting maybe 10 minutes because I get really hot really easily, hopping right into the ocean and then waiting to dry off before I put on more sunscreen. And this is really ineffective, an ineffective use of sunscreen. A lot of uh, experts will suggest putting on sunscreen before you leave the house, before going to the, sp- the spot that will you'll be sunning in, whether that be hiking, going to the pool, going to the beach, whatever. Um, and... Also, the effectiveness of your sunscreen depends on what type it is and, like I said, what activities you're planning on doing. And by type, I don't mean whether it's a lotion, a spray, a gel, or whatever. Now, there are two main types of sunscreen, and that is a physical sunscreen and a chemical sunscreen. Pretty much every person is used to using chemical sunscreen. Those are your sprays, your lotions, um, the stuff that is very easily found pretty much everywhere. Um, that is the stuff that you'll find like at your CVS or Walgreens in the, in the sunscreen aisle. Uh, chemical sunscreens are absorbers of UV rays as they attempt to enter the skin. On the other hand, physical sunscreens contain active mineral ingredients such as titanium dioxide or zinc oxide, which works by sitting on top of the skin to deflect damaging UV rays away from the skin. So I read an article from Forefront Dermatology that has that lists the pros and the cons of both physical and chemical sunscreen. So the pros of chemical sunscreen are that you need to use less to protect your skin because there's no risk of spaces between the sunscreen molecules after you apply them to your skin. It also tends to be thinner and spreads more easily on the thin, on the skin. However, there are a lot of cons. It requires about 20 minutes after application before it starts to work, and that is going back to me saying if you're I apply it when I'm at the pool or when I'm at the beach, it's definitely less effective than applying it before it kicks in. Um, Just applying it right when you get there is not going to be the protection that your skin needs. You're going to be sitting for at least 20 minutes with your skin exposed to those UVA and UVB rays. 
Um, it also has an increased chance of irritation and stinging due to the multiple ingredients combined in order to achieve broad spectrum UVA and UVB protection. Additionally, the higher the SPF you go, the higher the risk of irritation for sensitive skin skin types. And the protection that it, it offers gets used up more quickly when in direct UV light. So reapplication is a lot more frequent. And also it may clog pores for oily skin types because it's being absorbed into the skin. On the other hand, physical sunscreen uh, has more pros than cons, according to this website. It offers protection against both UVA and UVB rays and is naturally broad spectrum instead of chemicals. It protects from the sun as soon as it's applied, so no weight needed. It's basically like a, a sun shirt for your skin, which... I guess it's kind of redundant. A sun, sh- a sun shirt is like a, a shirt that you wear when you're at the beach that protects you from, from the sun and the physical sunscreen that you put on, which would, I think, be – I have a, a thing of zinc that I use to put on a burn scar from my leg. So I burned my leg in May, April, May, and it has kind of a nasty scar left by it and burns – Burn scars typically need to be covered up to prevent discoloration from the skin. So my doctor suggested if I were to go into the sun, I would need zinc. And zinc is a physical sunscreen. Um, so like I said, it's just kind of like a, like a specific guard for your skin. It, uh, physical sunscreen also lasts longer when in direct UV light, but not when wet or when you're sweating. It's less likely to cause a stinging irritation on your skin, and it's less likely to be pore clogging, making it ideal for acne-prone skin. It also has a longer shelf life. Um, Going back to it's less likely to be pore clogging, I don't pore clogging. I don't know exactly why that is. And if I had to make an educated guess, I would probably say it's because it's sitting on top of your skin rather than, I, I kind of touched on this earlier, rather than you absorbing it into your skin to protect your skin from UV rays, it just sits right on top. So it's not like it's going down deep into your pores. The cons of physical sunscreen is that it can rub off, it can sweat off, and it can rinse off easily, meaning you need to reapply it more often when you're outdoors, or when you're sweating, when you're swimming, etc. And it also may leave a white film on the skin, which makes some formulas incompatible for medium to dark skin tones. Uh, So physical sunscreen, I think, is what you would see in all of the cartoons of lifeguards that have the big white nose on. Like if you think of Mr. Crab or not Mr. Krabs, not Mr. Krabs, Larry the lobster, the lifeguard lobster from SpongeBob, he when SpongeBob wanted to be a lifeguard, he taught him to put the white stuff on his nose and that white stuff was (laughs) physical sunscreen. (laughs) Um, And another con of physical sunscreen is that it can be less protective if you don't apply it originally and then also reapply it generously and accurately since UV light can get between the sunscreen molecules and get into the skin. But regardless of which sunscreen you choose, it's important to make it a part of your daily skincare routine. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Regular application of sunscreen can reduce your chances of skin cancer while also prolonging the development of wrinkles and sunspots. You know, it's the the easiest way to make sure to to make sure that you're preventing your skin from aging. So now switching gears, we're going to talk. That's ways to protect your skin when you're in the sun using sunscreen. Talking about tanning. I know that it's summertime, people want to be tan. I, I, I understand that that is the trend that people go towards. I am a part of it. Now, we need to talk about tanning in beds and tanning in booths. I am not going to lie to you guys. I have tanned in beds and I've tanned in booths before. I'm a member of Planet Fitness and it comes free with a black card membership and it seems really easy, really convenient to just like after your workout, go and hop into your hop into your tanning bed for however long. I never did it more than I think seven minutes at a time, 
But, I mean, talking about anti-aging your skin, tanning beds and tanning booths are probably the worst way to age your skin. It's like, it's just, you're basically putting yourself into an oven of skin cancer. I would never recommend tanning in beds, artificial tanning in beds or booths to anybody. Um, and I I know it probably sounds kind of hypocritical coming from me going in tanning beds and booths, but I honestly have seen if the effects of, of going in a tanning bed or going in a tanning booth and it, it ages your skin. The more you, the more you do it. I was never a frequent, frequent user. Um, but I feel like, and maybe this is just my brain making it up. I saw more wrinkles in my skin after I did it. I looked, my skin was less, less dewy, less glowy. It just looked, it looked bad. Um, so I would definitely recommend going for a, a spray tan if you want a, a quick fix for a tan if you if you're looking for that for, for spray tan versus tanning in a booth spray tans especially during spring summertime will give you a discount they have a lot of sales and discounts and coupon codes the thing about spray tans is that it's kind of a tough it's not that tough but i think a, it's an mm, I'm trying to think of how to say this. It, a lot of people will not go with a tan that their skin tone, that would match their skin tone for, say, like, say people who don't get tan. Um, and that can make your tan look a lot more fake and more fake, less natural. Um, and the something I've discovered with spray tans, I've gotten a couple, is that you, it's... It, when you wash it off, like the more you shower and the more you bathe and the more you sweat and stuff, it it <laughs> it looks terrible. It looks terrible the more that you the more you sweat and the more you shower. I have discovered like my armpits being completely completely void of my spray tan that I got, and then seeing lines from like my ankles to my feet because I sweat on my feet and, you know, sweating in my armpits and even like in between my boobs from wearing bras and sports bras. So spray tanning and booth tanning are both not my number one choice for if you wanted to get an artificial tan. Um, Obviously, if you want to lay out in the sun to get some real tan, you would have to build it up over time and you'd have to be very, very safe using your sunscreen often, making sure you're doing it in a healthy way. If you are looking for a quick fake tan, I would suggest using the Juergens brand. I would say that I've tried three things from Juergens, three fake tan things from Juergens, and I've tried the fake tan mousse, I've tried the fake tan lotion, and I've tried the fake tan spray. And I think, actually, that's the order from worst to best fake tans for their products. The mousse is a lot more likely to be streaky, and I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's just the way that I'm applying it, but um, it, it, while it works very quickly, it, because it works so quickly, it's less, it's, it's harder to be able to hide mistakes. So if you apply too much, like on your ankles or on your knees, it is a lot more visible. Or if you streak it too much on your arms, it's a lot more visible than, say, if you did um, the lotion. I found that the lotion is a lot easier to make sure that you have a smooth application compared to the mousse. But my favorite thing that I've used of the Jurgens fake tan, it's the build a tan line, is their spray. I think the spray tan that they have has worked best for me. And that's and I know I just was cautioning you guys against not against, but I was just cautioning you about spray tans. The thing with the build a tan is that you're able to rub it in easily. So it, it kind of makes it easier for you don't have like a huge buildup on your on your body, so it's a little more natural looking than just having a huge your body your body just fully covered in fake tan. 
Um, that being said, any fake tan is you can get streaks with, but I think the order that I just told you all, the mousse to the lotion to the spray is the best thing that I've encountered that will give me a quicker fake tan. Now, with the lotion, I would suggest doing it the night before, whatever, wherever, whatever you want to be tan, I would suggest doing it the night before. And that's because it kind of grows over time. But if you're looking for just a quick little sun-kissed glow for you know, same day, I would suggest using the spray. The mousse is a little scarier to use, as I've as I've mentioned, because it's less reliable. Um, so with that, those are some tips on how to maintain your skin during the summer. I know a lot of people want to be want to have like a, a sun kiss glow during the summertime when you're you know at the beach or at the pool. So. I hope that those are some tips that can maybe help you get the look you want to achieve in a safe way and in a way that will enhance, so to speak, if you if you so choose, as well as protecting your skin against the damaging UVA and UVB rays. All right. Um, when we come back, I'm going to be talking to you guys about mask knee and that is mask acne so stick around because i'm going to give you some tips on how to combat it and also on how to enhance your look with a mask on so stick around we'll be right back tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts now listen close and hear this out there's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back. So if you weren't with us before the break, I was just talking about how to take care of your skin in the summer, whether that be if you feel like tanning or how to protect your skin and the how to protect your skin using various types of sunscreen, because believe it or not, there are multiple types of sunscreen. Um, now, hopping into a, this next segment, I want to talk about mask me. And that is a new term that has been coined since the pandemic has been going on. And it is a mixture of the words mask and acne. It means ma getting acne from wearing a mask. So mask me is from wearing your mask all day and then you can get breakouts in the area, especially around your nose, your cheeks, chin or any place that's included with under your mask. Um, according to dermatologist Angeline Yang, the quote, constant rubbing of the masks against our skin causes micro tears, which allows easier entry for bacteria and dirt to clog up our pores. Now, in addition to that, there's humidity trapped under the mask from you breathing in and out. And the mask absorbs the oils of your skin, which trigger you to produce more oil, which can cause more breakouts. And this is especially bad for your pores if you're wearing makeup under your mask. And I get it. It is, it is a habit if you were to put on makeup 
for the part of your face that is covered by a mask. It's just like daily routine. You do your you do your moisturizer, you do your concealer or foundation, you do concealer, whichever order. I know people do it in a lot of different orders. Um, and a lot, I'm sure a lot of people are seeing right now with their mask knee, they're doing more and more product for the part that's under their mask. Um, and I have been trying to do less and less makeup because I realize as I'm venturing out into the world more and more because I'm going to be working more and more, um, I'm going to have to be cognizant of the fact that I don't think I want to put as much makeup on under my mask because, it, you know, it's covered by a mask anyway. Um, but here are some, some suggestions for ways you can, you know, try to avoid mask need the, with the more that you're wearing a mask and also how to amp up your look while wearing a mask. So one dermatologist recommends opting for more lightweight water-based products underneath your mask. A lightweight moisturizer can also act as an additional protective barrier and prevent chafing between the mask and your skin. Um, another way you can prevent mask knee is just by washing your mask, you know, using a fresh, not a fresh mask every time, but making, if you have a cloth mask that is a reusable one, um, making sure that you're washing those regularly the same way that you would wash uh, your workout clothes because those dirty clothes can make you break out on your body if you don't wash them enough. Um, one article I read so with washing your masks, one article I read said that some dermatologists are suggesting a sono mask, which comes from an Israeli startup company that developed an anti-pathogen fabric, which is interesting. I'm, it's basically for to stop the spread of, of pandemics using anti-pathogen technology in this fabric. But these can be like, $70 because of the very, very special type of fabric that they're using. So one, a very simple way to do it is just your basic wash your face regularly, make sure you're taking care of your skin, paying extra attention to the skin that's underneath your mask, as well as, you know, regularly, regular cleanliness, and that it would be from washing your mask. Uh, Dr. Yang also says that ideally one would be using a very gentle exfoliator that facilitates the absorption of your lightweight water-based moisturizer. So according to this article from the BBC, the skincare industry is seeing a huge boom while the makeup industry seems to be taking a hit, which makes sense because in quarantine, people are not wearing makeup as much. They're not going out. And y'all have heard me say this time and time again. I don't really wear makeup anymore, um, especially makeup that is under my mask. I used to, my favorite part of my makeup routine would be putting on my blush and my bronzer, but I've just stopped doing that because it's, it, my cheeks and my, my face is just covered by my mask. Um, but also, according to this BBC article, makeup for the parts of your face that are visible above your mask are growing in profits. And these are your brow stuff, your eyeshadows, your eyeliners, your mascaras. Uh, you know, contouring is out with the with the mask wearing now, according to <laughs> according to this article. People don't aren't super big on the big contour anymore. If you're going to be going out and wearing a mask, instead they suggest if you want to individualize your look, make it a little more glam, make it a little more creative, you would go for a bold eye. People are going for a lot of colorful looks, colorful shadows, colorful palettes to make their make it more dynamic and have a, a, a stronger, more predominant look for their eyes because they're wearing masks. Um, and additionally, people aren't wearing their, their face makeup anymore because of the makeup will just come off under the mask. And so a lot of people are also looking for lipsticks and lip stains that are smudge resistant and will kind of, that'll, that'll stay on longer should you need to take off your mask. 
Um, but to generally to avoid maskne, I would say you should just keep up your regular skincare regimen, making sure you're paying extra attention to problem spots that would come from wearing a mask constantly for a long period of time. Um, other ways, so that would mean making sure you're keeping your skin clear when you're not, when you're wearing your mask. So like I keep saying, not wearing the makeup under the mask was already step one. Step two, making sure you're cleaning that skin regularly, making sure it's fresh, making sure you're, it's being sanitary by washing your mask. Um, using spot correction stuff when needed. I know Mel has done an episode on pimple patches. So if you need any tips from about pimple patches, maybe you want to try them out, definitely go and take a listen to her episode on that. Um, and if you, should you need to, I've seen a couple dermatologists recommend if you're by yourself in your car, if you can get away to your office and be by yourself, um, take your mask off when you can, when it is safe. Don't put other people at risk because you're saying that your mask is bothering you. Um, make sure you're doing doing what you can to be safe and be be clean, making sure keeping your hygiene up, making sure you're washing your face, and just just taking precautionary steps. Um well, that's all I have for mask knee. So stick around, you guys, because when we come back, I'm going to be going through my... <laughs> and I I already said this. It might just be fun for me, but I think it will be funny in talking about taking care of your skin, especially in the makeup realm. Talking about old, old makeup, that'll probably just make me break out everywhere. Um... I'm going to be going through my old, old makeup that I have found from cleaning out my childhood bedroom and cleaning out my childhood bathroom. <laughs> so if you want to see what wonderful treasures I'm going to find, stick around. We'll be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Okay, guys, welcome back for our final segment. We're going to do something a little a little more lighthearted and funny. Um, so I just recently moved up to our third floor, which is where my older brother used to live. Um, and he has his own apartment now. And so because I'm home, I my parents let me move up there to kind of have a little bit of my own space and everything. So in the process of moving out of my childhood room, I came across two bags full of makeup products. And I genuinely don't know when the last time I touched these products were. It probably was sometime my sophomore year of high school. That would be 2014, I think, maybe 2015, maybe my junior year. Um, so I just want to go through and kind of see what types of products I was using before I really started paying attention to what I was putting on my skin and what I thought looked really good for me and all of that kind of stuff. So I have not looked in these bags in, in years, in at at the very bare minimum, five years. Um, and the shelf life for makeup varies, but I know that old makeup is never, never ideal. 
So let's just let's just take a look. Okay, so first thing I'm seeing is an e.l.f. BB Cream Broad Spectrum SPF 20 Sunscreen Foundation. Um, B, well, BB Cream Foundation. So this looks way too dark for my skin tone. I'm going to swap. Ew. It was very <laughs> clumpy. I just squeezed a little bit out onto my hand. You know, for a BB cream, this is very heavy. This is a very heavy BB cream. And it looks like, I've, if I remember correctly, this made my skin so greasy. And so, because I didn't, I never really used powder. If I used powder, I used way too much. And I also thought powder made me look sickly pale because I didn't have the right tint of powder. Um, so I would never use powder with this. But this is definitely more of a foundation than a BB cream. I Like, this is a foundation with, it just happens to be a BB cream on the label. It is so thick. And it smells exactly like sunscreen. Like, this stuff is, this is a tinted sunscreen, if I had to guess. It's very thick. And I, yeah, I remember this made me very, very greasy. Didn't help with breakouts ever. It really didn't help to do anything for my skin because... I would just sweat it all off, and because this skin tone is on the, it's on the darker side, like if I were to be out in the sun a lot, I think this would be my summer tone. I haven't really been able to be in the sun a lot recently, um, so that tells me that I would be wearing this in the summertime, and so me wearing this in the summertime, while it's a greasy, greasy formula with, and I'm on top of that, the grease that's probably on my face from sweating so much, this would not be a good combination. So I, the lid is also cracked. I don't know when I bought that. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Um, oh, it's an old, an oldie but a goodie, an old hula by Benefit, that bronzer. It's a great bronzer. It's in my ballet bar the bronze, the blush and bronzer bar that I have. That's one of my favorite products right now. Um, it's just, it's just hula crumbs in this. Why did I save this? It's just a little plastic, plastic sample, not for sale. It's just a sample of, of hula. Um, and all it has are crumbs on it, which I don't think would do anything for me trying to bronze my face or contour or anything. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm unsure why I still have this. I think... I'm kind of the person that really wants to use everything to the last drop. So I think I think that's why I have hoarded a lot of this makeup in general is because I want to use it until I'm done with it. Um, I'm unsure what I thought these crumbs of bronzer would do for me um, because I can't even, like, if I were to dust it onto a brush, it just would, it would be too, too clumpy for me to have a good, a good contour. That's... <laughs> All right, can't wait to throw that away. Um, next, this is oh god, I don't I don't even know what this is. It looks like so it came with a brush. It looks like this was a part of a set because it has steps three and four. Me vein champagne. This is definitely a face powder, and this is definitely from Benefit. Um, I think it came with a. Uh, I'm putting, this is a great powder. I don't even use powder, but this is a great powder. Um, I don't even use any of this stuff, but I think it was like a, for your face and it came with, for a while I was really into, um, uh, Boeing, the, the Boeing, uh, um, concealer kit or kit, not kit, but it's like the Boing concealer that I really liked it a lot. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure it had a sample of that. And I definitely used the concealer a lot, but I'd never used the powder. But I'm wondering what one and two were because it, it it's three and four. Three was definitely the Boing concealer. Four is this powder and me vein champagne face powder. It also comes with a cute little mini brush, which has never been used until just now when I put that powder on my, on my hand. Um, oh, if I remember, I'm pretty sure it had a pore minimizer as well as a foundation in the, in the face kit. Um, 
yeah, I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure that's what this kit was. I don't know what happened to the poor minimizer. The the poor professional, I'm pretty sure it had in there. Um, I guess I used it as well as with the concealer, but I don't I don't have it. All I have left is this powder, which is interesting, an interesting choice for me to keep this powder since I don't I don't use powder. Like I, <laughs> I don't know why it's here. It's probably because it's an untouched pan basically and I couldn't bear to get rid of it. Um oh this is another good benefit. I loved Benefit. I still like Benefit, but I just haven't gotten anything from them besides the, the bronze bar. This is another palette called Greetings from Cabana Glamma, your dust tan nation makeup kit. Um, and this kit had, I think this was definitely supposed to be like a summer palette. It came with a pan of hula. It came with some kind of gorgeous uh, concealer or like a, the in between, between concealer and foundation, which is completely empty. So I don't know why it's still, I don't know why. It's, well, it's not completely empty. There's some, there are some on the lid. I repeat, there is some product on the lid that I can't even, it's completely dried up. It's completely crumbled, but I, <laughs> I still have it. Why wouldn't I throw this away? Oh God. It also comes with three eyeshadows. And the eyeshadows were, they don't tell me the colors. That's tough. Um, but it's a light shimmery pink, a medium shimmery brown, and a dark shimmery brown. And it also came with the posy tint. And that posy tint is the lip tint that you can use also as a cheek, it's a lip and cheek tint. I, what is that benefit? color. It's a posy tint and um, it, ha it comes in a couple other other colors. Um, I liked the darker color of the tint better, but the posy tint came with this, so you I remember liking it. It wasn't I don't think it was my favorite because it made my lips lighter than I wanted, but it was a great for a tint blush. And I remember using this palette on my friend at her mom's wedding, and that was... God, it had to be probably in eighth or ninth grade. It probably it had to be eighth or ninth grade when I used this palette last. Um, which is a well, bummer. These these eyeshadow colors are really pretty. Um, they're they're just very shimmery. They're not super pigmented. Um, they basically they are they are for shimmer. So I don't know why I still have that because the only thing that I would keep in there, the only reason I would keep it is because of the eyeshadows and looking at these eyeshadows now, they're, they're not it. They're not it. Oh, geez. Okay. Next product is a peel off gel mask, renewing cucumber, Freeman brand. Um, ew, ew. I, yeah, I don't remember buying this. I don't remember the last time I used it. It has a very basic marketing, like a, like a branding. It smells great because it's cucumber. Um, but we know now that peeling masks are not that great for your skin. It, they pull off the hairs on your skin and they pull out your, the sebum that can be in your pores, but they aren't actually all that super effective for, uh, pulling out like blackheads or pulling out, um, or like actually cleansing your pores. So not my number one purchase ever, I think. Oh God, I have gel all over my hands now from this mask. Um, it smells nice. I should throw this away because I can only imagine what this would do to my skin now with all the ingredients. What, what even are the ingredients in this? Um, water, alcohol, alcohol, glycerin, we like glycerin. Um, a lot of smells in here. Stuff that I'm not exactly recognizing. Um, yeah, I don't... <laughs> they have an Instagram. They're pubbing their Instagram on the back of the bottle. So it couldn't have been too long ago that I got that. But I don't... I don't think I would ever use that. I probably used it once. It feels very heavy. So I probably used it one time and was like, I don't like this. And then I never used it again. <laughs> All right. Let's see. What else do we have? Oh, geez. 
the Lush Ocean Salt Face and Body Scrub. And it's vodka infused. And it has, let's see, what are the other, other ingredients? Sea salt, grapefruit infusion, fine sea salt, and coarse sea salt. That's a lot of sea salt. Uh, probably really, really dried out my skin. I remember using this on my body, though, and I really liked the way it exfoliated and the way it left my skin. Um, I, I mentioned a couple episodes uh, ago that exfoliants are kind of a, a tough, a, not a debated topic, but, you know, trying to find natural natural alternatives to microbeads and finding good ingredients in exfoliants that aren't too stripping of your skin are... Take a, take a little bit of research, but I remember really liking this Lush product, and I remember I do remember having to moisturize because it definitely like, it has two different types of salt in it, so that's not gonna it's not gonna hydrate my skin. But I definitely cleansed my skin. But knowing what I know now, I probably would not use this again, just because I know that in the long run, this is probably not as great for my skin as I would hope. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an empty pot of this ocean salt scrub. I think I was doing that thing where if you brought five, yeah, right here, bring back five clean lush pots with this logo and get a free face, a free, a fresh mask free. Um, so I have one, uh, <laughs> um, maybe I have a couple more pots somewhere that I was trying to hoard so I could, I could get my, my fresh mask for free. I, who knows? Um, oh, geez. What is this? Oh, my gosh. So this is like an eyeshadow. I don't even know what, what I would call this. It's like a highlighter, basically, like a powder highlighter and a rolly ball from the brand Bella Il, Il Fiore. And it's like a pink, a pinky shimmery. Very pigmented. I use this as an eyeshadow, but I realize now it's probably definitely supposed to be a highlighter. Um, I don't know what's in it. It's very powdery, very glittery. Um, it looks like fairy dust, so it's it's fun. But, um, yeah, God, I don't know why I still have this. That, that's literally all I know about it. That's all that it, it says. It says Bella Il Fiore, and it's a powdery pink dust that you apply using a roller ball. That's, that's the product. That's, a, that's my pitch. <laughs> um, moving on. Maybelline Brow Drama. I definitely got this for my mom because I never started doing my brows until this year. Um, the Pomade Crayon. Now, I don't know why I only have the crayon because I would imagine I would do this with a spoolie of some kind. But I only have the pomade crayon, and that tells me that I was just coloring in my eyebrows with this pomade crayon, and that's probably why I stopped doing it, because it probably looked like I was just chunking on eyebrows. It, like, why didn't I have a spoolie? Why didn't I try and shape them at all? What <laughs> what was my what was my rationale, I'm wondering, by for keeping this? I was probably like, hmm, I'll learn how to use this someday. And you know what? I have, while I've learned how to use, do my brows, I have not learned how to use this. So that's got, that's gotta go. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, oh my gosh. I have a sample of a Benefit Their Real Mascara. It is as dry and crusty as the day is long. I have no idea. There's no reason for me to still have this. Um, it's still got a little, still got a little product. I'm swatching it onto my hand right now. Um, this is, <laughs> I don't even know how old this is. Ew. This probably it has so much bacteria on it. I'm sure. Jeez Louise. Why did I keep this? Again, one of those things, probably the answer to every single question that I'm asking. And if that question is, why did I keep this? It's because I want to use this as much as I possibly can before having to go, throw it away. Um, yeah, but geez, the, the mascara is probably my number one thing that I don't want to use. I don't want to keep it for a long, 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 long time. So that's bonkers that I still have that. 
um, I probably forgot it. Oh, I hit the mic. I probably forgot that I was in there and then just let it, basically left it to rot. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, I'll do one more product. Oh, geez, there's an, this, this doesn't count, but I just found some latex-free eyelash glue. So this has to be from at least junior year, because that's when I wore fake lashes for a musical. Oh my god, it is still liquidy. This lash glue is still liquidy. Hear ye, hear ye. This is not a tube of dried up lash glue. Would I ever use it again on my eyes? No. But it's not, I was fully expecting it to be completely dried up, but it looks like it's it's pretty full and is I'm saying it's still usable in the sense that it would probably work, but I d I'm not going to try it because I don't feel like getting an eye infection in the middle of a pandemic. Um, okay, last product I'm going to talk about is this. Oh, I loved this. This L'Oreal Infallible Lacquer Liner. And it comes in this little pot with an, a, an applicator brush. I don't even know what kind of brush this is. Um, and what you do is you dip it in the pot and it looks, this brush is just looks like a little teeny tiny painter's brush. Um, and you basically, I remember having to squeeze it so that I could get a sharper line to put it on as eyeliner, but you just dip this, I, I say swirled around, well, it's really dried up now. Um, but it's basically like a cream eyeshadow and it goes on a lot thicker than an eyeshadow crayon would but I remember really liking this it's definitely a more dramatic look than just using a, a normal eyeliner crayon or like what I like to do and using an angled brush a small angled brush and using eyeshadow um, I would probably equate this to maybe a liquid liner pen but I I always liked this. It's just it's just thick is what it is. It's that's why it's tough to maneuver. It takes a lot more to kind of buff it out and shape it in the way that you want it. Um, but yeah, that's also oh my gosh, I just also found an Elf eyeliner and shadow stick. So it's double sided black eyeshadow and black eyeliner. <laughs> oh they why do I still? I keep asking why do I still have all this stuff? And the answer is because I couldn't bear to get rid of it, even though, like, this... I'll never get over this. This cracked hula sample plastic... plastic little palette. Why did my mom make me throw this away? Well, my mom was never in my stuff. But for what reason? What was my logic for keeping this the crumbs of hula? Why couldn't I just get a, get a different one? Anyways, that's... <laughs> You guys have been listening to me unpack my very old, old, the oldest makeup I have, probably. Um, and it was probably an interesting ride for you guys to revisit all of these products with me. Um, anyways, stick around, or not stick around, stick around for next week's episode because I'm going to be talking to you guys about black owned beauty businesses that you should really be shopping from. Um, you guys have been listening to the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Betsy Scarisbrick. Uh, thank you guys for listening and hanging out with me, and I'll see you next week. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsncpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network, from health and wellness to entertainment and life and happiness to sex and relationships. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast.